Hi, I'm Orvi Patel, and I have had one abortion that was followed by, I had two miscarriages and then one abortion right after that. So my story is a little bit different where I already had an older child. She was four years old. Um, and my husband and I, we'd been trying to have a second baby. And unfortunately, every time I got pregnant, I ended up miscarrying. So it was two times back to back. I wasn't even 35 yet at the time. I was 33 years old. So my doctor basically told me, you need to go to a fertility specialist. We need to figure out what is going on with your body that it's rejecting these pregnancies. So we figured that out. I basically, my body just rejects the pregnancies. It, it thinks it's a foreign thing in, in me. So it sends all these, um, it sends things to fight the pregnancy. And so I just have to take blood thinners, which are injections directly into the stomach to help thin out the blood. So no platelets, like nothing's clogging up the placenta. So when I found out I was pregnant again, the first thing I did, I actually hid it from my husband for like, I don't know, a good six weeks, eight weeks. It was a while. Um, I, I went and made my appointment with the fertility doctor. I had told her, you know, cause they said after they had figured it out, they're like, you need to come in as soon as you find out the next time you're pregnant so we can get you on these blood thinners. So I went on those blood thinners and I was giving myself injections every morning. He never knew for almost eight weeks it was. Um, and then after that, we had to schedule appointments between the fertility doctor, my OB, and, uh, you know, just a fertility specialist too, a neonatal doctor. Um, so it was multiple people tracking. Um, we were excited cautiously. <laughs> it was it wasn't, you know, I'm in my thirties, so it's okay. So it's, and, and I'm established. This isn't a, I'm not 16 freaking out. I'm not, you know, and I can't even imagine having to be in that situation going through what I went through. And I had, you know, the support of my husband with me. Um, but yeah, we, we were in a good place when I found out I was pregnant, we were happy and we, it's, what we had wanted and, you know, and then things kind of went downhill after that. So that's kind of like the beginning of everything. So the moment that I needed to have, like that thought came to our head, my head, his head was very different than most of the young people that are going to be going through, you know, anybody that goes through this journey. My story is not unique, actually. I'm a member of a group of women that have had almost the same similar path. It's we're established. We, we have, some of us already have children. We wanted a second child or a third child, whatever it might be. And what happens is at 19 weeks, you go in for a full body ultrasound on your baby. So they go in and they take a look and they measure the growth of internal organs and limbs and everything they and make sure it's kind of along the track that it's supposed to be and previous to that appointment you know they kind of just listen to to the baby's heartbeat and my doctor had made a couple comments like oh you know the heartbeat's a little bit faster but you know we'll just keep an keep an eye on it and when we went in for that neonatal scan um we you know the technician got very quiet and as soon as the technician gets quiet you know things are not good so she got very quiet and then she's like we you need to talk to the doctor and so the doctor we went in and we we're sitting there and we were just kind of like what's happening you know and the doctor said that your baby and we weren't even going to find out the sex of the baby but at that point, that was irrelevant. Like, you know, 
completely out the window, everything. He said, you're, you have, you know, it's a baby boy and his heart is not developing at the rate that it should be. Basically his left ventricle is so small that the right side of his heart is doing all the pumping and the left side's not working at all. So immediately he had us go to a cardiologist that, that does more scans and to talk to them to find out about it. So we had to go do that. We, we, you know, and I have a four-year-old at the time and I'm freaking out because I'm like, Oh my God, she's in school. Like, what do we do? We don't have family here. Like, you know, so I'm calling my friends and saying, somebody's got to go pick her up and bring her to your house. Like we've got, we're, and we're in Atlanta. It's not the easiest place to get from point A to point B. And then to point C, it's, I mean, it takes a minute. So we had to, you know, we drove, we got to our place, we waited two and a half hours to see the cardiologist, the pediatric cardiologist. He takes a look at this, he does the, you know, the scans on the baby's heart. And then he sits us down and he says, your baby has hypoplasty left part syndrome. That's what it's called. Um, it happens in one of, God, that it's been eight years now, but I knew this number off the back of my head. It was like one in like 4,000. So it's not super common. And most of the people don't make it till into their forties. Um, because the way now that could change now with the, with the development of science and, you know, just medicine progressing. And that makes sense, you know, but because the baby's heart, the ventricle is so small, you can't, it's, it's tiny. It's like this, like we all have ventricles that pump blood in and out of our heart. The one side of his ventricle was not opening. It doesn't open. It's too small. So what they said was that he would have to have multiple procedures that would reroute the way his blood flow works throughout his entire body. Um, and he said that this is one of the worst cases I've ever seen because it's a spectrum. So you could have people that are on the better side of the spectrum that can still live with it with some surgeries. But then there's people on the other side of the spectrum that it's tough. And he, you know, he's like, I need to speak with you more about this. We're going to talk about it. And this all happened the very first day. And I mean, that was, it was hard after two miscarriages and then finally figuring out what was wrong, why we couldn't stay pregnant to have this happen. We were just like, what are you kidding me right now? Um, and actually this is kind of ironic. I don't know if ironic's the right word, but eight years ago, almost exactly to the day that we found this out. Cause yeah, it was, it was right at the beginning of March, right around this time that we were going through all this. And it was eight years ago that we found this out and we were just like, we just kind of looked at each other, like, what do we do? And you know, most men, most husbands, they don't, they present themselves as super strong. We both lost it. We're in the parking garage. He's crying. I'm crying. We, we can't, I can't focus. And I'm like, okay, I, I, we, we have a kid. We got to think we, you know, I'm like, you need to drive. We have to go pick her up. I just want to hold her. Like we got to go, you know? And I mean, literally I walked into my friend's house and I crumbled and I just held on to my baby girl and just held her because she didn't even know we were pregnant at the time. Like she didn't know she was going to be a big sister. And that's all she ever wanted was to be a big sister. She's four years old. All her friends are, are big sisters and she's not. And she's like, I want a baby. Where's my baby? You know? And I'm like, and we were, you know, like she didn't really, we had just told our friends and family, but she hadn't comprehended that fact just quite yet. Um, but all of our friends and family knew and we had just told them the week before. And then now we got this news and we had waited 18 weeks to tell people. So when, pe you know, most people tell at around 12 weeks, 13 weeks, we waited 18 because with the two miscarriages, we just didn't feel that we could say anything until we were kind of like over 
that danger zone. So we, you know, we had that. And then the doctor, we made an appointment with the pediatric oncologist uh, or the pediatric cardiologist again. And he said to us, he, he gave us options. We talked to a, you know, a facility in Boston. We talked to a facility in New York where they do in vitro ballooning of the baby's heart. But that's a temporary fix. It just means that as soon as the baby's born, they take and they do open her heart surgery on him and blow, put another balloon in. And this is continuously, like he'd have multiple procedures throughout his years, but there's no guaranteeing that he would live past 10 is what they told us. They're like, 10 years is all we can really truly say. Is he going to live past 10? We can't tell you that, you know, then we got all that information, went back to the pediatric cardiologist armed with all this information. My husband was on board. He's like, let's do this. I was kind of like hesitant because I was like, I don't think you you're understanding what this all entails. I was like, this is not your run of the mill kid. This is a child that is going to need more attention, need more of us, need, you know, that, and we already have a little girl. We have a four-year-old. She needs us too. How, how are we supposed to say that this child that we currently have already for four years of her life is now secondary to this new one that we're supposed to have? It was, I mean, it's the guilt and the mind games that the, just psychologically what you go through with, with a situation like this. And like I said, this is not just my story. This is the story of many, many women. When people talk about abortion and not, you know, you, you banning abortions at 15 weeks, oh my God, Florida has triggered all of us because all of us found out about our baby's problems at 19 weeks, you know, and the problems run the gamut. Like they, you know, somebody's limbs didn't develop. Someone's organs are on the outside of their body. Someone's brain, the baby's brain didn't develop. You know, they, they, there's all these issues that you can't control. So to actually get pregnant, stay pregnant, and then grow a human inside your body is truly an act, a miracle in and of itself to get through all those stages. But to get to this point, you know, he was still very optimistic that we would be able to continue. The thing that sold it for him, because I was already on the train of, I have to let this baby go. Unfortunately, my brain over my heart was winning that situation. The thing that really sealed it for my husband was when we spoke to the pediatric cardiologist again, he said, look, this child of yours, he is going to be like a kid with cancer. He's going to require all your focus. Your older one is going to suffer because she will not be able to treat this child like a normal kid because he's not, a, he's not going to be a normal kid, you know? And he's like, he's going to have multiple surgeries. He's like, seriously, this is one of the worst cases of this that we we have seen. That's why those doctors in Boston are excited to get their hands on you because you never find, catch this it's so early. You normally catch it right towards the end of a pregnancy or when the baby's born or whatever. Like you don't catch it at 18, 19 weeks. You, you know, he's like, that's why they're very excited to like do this procedure and see how it works. And I'm like, okay, I don't know that I want to be a guinea pig for science, but you know, he was very straightforward with us. And then the one thing, like he said, he's like, and I have to tell you, these babies feel a lot of pain. He's like, you know, they, they are on all these drugs for, you know, for the procedures. But once they come off of them, he's like, man, that, that crying, that screaming, he's like, I've been in the NICU when that happens. And he's like, it is so hard 
to listen to. He's like, they're in a lot of pain and then they have to come off of the drugs too. And that's hard also. And he's like, it's a lot. He's like, it, it's a lot. And that was the thing that actually sealed it for my husband to get on board with what I was like, I can't put him through that. I can't put our, put our daughter through that. And he was like, yeah, we can't, we can't do that to him. He's like, selfishly, I want to keep them. And I was like, I do too. Has nothing to do with that. I was like, whatever choice we make is wrong. There is no right choice in this situation. There, this is not a, I am 16 years old. I have the rest of my life. I may regret this, but I have this is what I have to do because this is the right choice for my life. There was no right choice. Not in this. There wasn't one. We never had a clear cut, like with some of these other women that I've spoken to, they had a clear cut. Your baby cannot survive post birth. You know, they were, they were told that your baby will not survive post birth. We were never told that we were told your baby could survive. That's a choice you have to make. Is he, is it going to be the best quality of life? Probably not, you know? And so that's where we kind of struggled and struggled and talked and talked. And we only talked to each other. And we talked with, like, I had to let it out and talk. He, he wanted nothing to do with anybody. He latched onto me. He latched onto our little family. I, I couldn't, I felt suffocated. I was like, I cannot handle your grief my grief all at once it was like I have to talk to other people and you know and I did and I was like and I never got anything negative no matter what if people were pro-choice or pro or not nobody said anything to me about it being like you're killing your baby or anything like that which I I'm very thankful for, because like I said, if I was 16 and I did that, it would be a totally different reaction that I would be getting, you know? However, I'm not, I'm 33, 34 years old at the time. And people are like, yeah, like we get it. You know, we get why you have to do this. Like it was hard. It was harder. It was actually the hardest for my dad to actually accept that we were, he, he doesn't have any sons. He's got three daughters now, and now he's got two granddaughters. That's it. That's it. So he wanted this boy really badly, but it wasn't, it just wasn't meant to be or whatever. And that's a choice that I live with every single day. And for that, you know, during that time period, it was awful. I broke down in the shower I just, I couldn't get out of bed sometimes. I wasn't eating. I'm like, what's the point? It's not like I have a baby to feed. You can feel him moving and it would just, you know, you just like, and at 20 weeks and five days, you know, we, we did it and it was awful. It was the worst experience of my life. It's not something that I wish upon anybody whether it's by choice, by force, by whatever, it doesn't matter because any woman that goes through it at any age does not matter, is not going in there gleefully, is not going in there happily. It, it, it matters not if you're 16 or if you're 40. It matters not if your baby's perfectly healthy or not. It doesn't matter. Every single woman that's going in there is going in there heartbroken over whatever it might be, you know, it doesn't matter. It is not something you just say, oh, I'm just gonna have an abortion. Cause it's not the way that it works, you know, and to not have, I couldn't even imagine not doing it without support. At least I had my husband for my support and I did and my family. So that was great, but it psychologically, it messes you up for a while. <laughs> so, yeah. As far as my personal experience, it was, it was different than even some of the women that I'm in my support group with that they have experienced in the last few years because rules and things have changed. So for me, I actually had to go to my doctor's office and this was, I will say, this was one of the worst and hardest parts. We had to go into my doctor's office to get the paperwork 
to do the abortion the morning of. And I'm sitting there waiting in a room with pregnant women. And I'm like, this is God awful. I'm like, get me out of here, you know? And I'm sitting there trying not to lose it. Like I was trying very, very, very hard to not lose it, lose my control, whatever it was, you know? And by the time I thought I was about to lose it, the woman was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Kept you waiting. It was, there was a screw up and she was very apologetic, you know, and I didn't fault them for that because I think they just thought that they were, we were going to hand and go, you know, but, and I couldn't even send somebody else in because I had to physically sign for the paperwork. That was awful. But then once we got that paperwork, we had to, we did it at our hospital. They have, you know, a a special wing that you go into. They don't, you know, there's nobody else there. We went in, they took us back immediately, didn't wait in the waiting area. They knew who I just handed the paperwork. They just took us straight back and we were in the room and just laying there and before we did it, what happens is that the doctor comes in and they talk to you. Are you sure you want to do this? They have to ask mentally, whatever. I get that. They have to ask. But a person that has gotten to that point hasn't, is not going to necessarily change their mind. I don't, especially an older woman, maybe a younger woman might. I'm not going to say that they, they haven't thought it through and they're just walking in because there's a lot of steps before you just walk in. You don't just walk in. It's, it, there's a lot that happens before that point. So, you know, they have to ask. My husband asked them to do one last scan on the baby to make sure he's like, I don't know if he was hoping for some miracle or what. I was like, it's not going to happen. Like the, the baby's heart isn't developed. Like we, we saw it. We saw how small his ventricle was. We saw it multiple times. It's not there. It's not developed, you know? And I think that he was just hoping, just pulling out a little bit of hope. And, you know, they, she, she did it. She scanned it and she's like, here it is. Here's, here's where the problem is. And she showed and everything. And then what they do is they give you a numbing um, needle. And you know, because they take a needle like that long, it is very long, that they then inject into your, the baby's heart, the fetus's heart to stop the heart of the fetus, especially when you're that far along. Cause I was 20 weeks and five days, which is halfway through pregnancy. Now imagine a woman that's carrying a baby up to that point wants their baby. That is not a person that's doing this because all of a sudden they woke up one morning and decided they didn't want to be pregnant, you know, 20 weeks and five days, you want your baby. So I'm laying there. And the only thing that got me like prevented me from going into hysterics is I had a picture of my already four-year-old beautiful little girl. That was the only thing that, I mean, I'm crying. My husband's crying. My mom and dad were there. They're both crying, you know, and my mom doesn't cry. She's not a crier, but she had lost it also. And, you know, and that was the only thing that kept me from just, just screaming was that I just held on to that picture of my little girl and was like, I have her, I have her, I have her. That was the only thought that that could go into my head. And then you're waiting. I mean, we waited for 35 minutes, I believe, because they keep checking every 10 minutes to see if the baby's heart has stopped. And then after that happens, they take you up to a room because guess what? You're not done you have to deliver. You have to push that baby out of you. Can't live there. So that's the next step. And I've had two, now two, two babies. So I had my first one, you know, I had her, it was about 18 ish hours of labor, something like that. My second one was like, I sneezed and she came out and But this one, almost two days in labor, 
to get this baby out. It was, we went in at like around noon on a Thursday. It was, I shouldn't say two days. It was like a day and a half. And I didn't deliver him until the following day past midnight. So it was a day and a half of labor for a baby that would, whose heart would never be, who wouldn't live, who wouldn't take a breath, who wouldn't cry, nothing, you know, and you're just laying there and it's like, what do you do? You know, you, you try and distract yourself, but then you feel weird about laughing at a TV show. You, then you start crying because you're like, oh my God, I'm laughing at a TV show and I'm laying in the hospital about to deliver my dead baby. You know, like it's the dichotomy of emotions that you go through. It's on extremes. It's, 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 you know, and then the crazy thing was, was that they, you know, they start you on Pitocin to try and induce labor. And then, you know, they gave me so much Pitocin that just nothing was happening. By the time I actually delivered the baby, there was not a single person in the room. My husband had run out to go get the nurse. It was past midnight. I had was pushing the call button. Nobody had come. And I was like, I, I have to push. And I just pushed. There's no one there. Not a nurse, not a doctor, not my husband and nobody. And I just laid there and I was like, I just had this baby. No one knew, you know, but it was, it was kind of good in a way because I was like, that was like my own mental release of the whole thing, you know? And luckily they put you, at least at our hospital, I will say, they put you in a wing where you can't hear kids, you can't hear babies, you can't hear, you know, children, you can't hear babies crying, which I was so grateful for because to hear a baby crying, knowing that you aren't gonna be going home with one is awful. I, I, I mean, that would send anybody over the edge, you know, and so they do there. And I think what happened was the reason it sticks out in my mind was because I heard a little, I heard a small child's voice and then something crying and a nurse came running into my room. And she said, I'm so sorry, children aren't allowed back here, but the, you know, the, the, the a little girl got loose and she came coming she came running back looking for her mom and she was crying and I was like it's okay I have a four-year-old it's okay completely understand that's probably what my kid would do too you know looking for her mom and that she can't she hasn't seen in two days you know I'm like I totally understand no worries and she's like no we like to keep this wing as quiet as possible I'm like I get it I understand you know so they are the nurses all know the situation whether or not they agree with it, they never say at all. Some of them will come in and you can tell that they don't agree with the choice you made, but they're a nurse, their job is to care for you as a patient. Others come in and you know that they're heartbroken for you because they will just lean over and give you a hug. I had a couple nurses that, that just came in and one of them had to walk out because she was just crying and she's like I'm not upset with you and she came back in to explain herself and she said I'm not upset with you for the for the decision you had to make I'm upset that you're going through it and I feel for you so you know I'm sorry for walking out with you know but I, it just it just hit me really hard like you are not somebody that obviously wants to be going through this you have to be and I'm like yeah so I mean it runs you know, there's a spectrum there. But for overall, at least the experience was good. Walking out of a hospital without a baby in your arms is hard. That's just the way it is. And I've actually had to do that multiple times. I didn't take my older one out of the hospital because she had to be in the NICU. I didn't take my little one out of the hospital because she had to be in the NICU. So it was like, never, I said to my husband when I had my last child, I said, I've never left this hospital with a kid in my arms. Like I've never had the baby in the wheelchair that you see people doing. That has never been us. I've always been just me in the wheelchair. And that time that was the hardest, you know, because they tell you a lot of things. 
they forget that you have to give birth. Then they forget that your body thinks that you de delivered a baby. So guess what? Your milk then comes in and all of a sudden your breasts are engorged and you're like, what the hell is happening? So it is not a one and done situation. It is, it goes on for a while, you know, after that point. The birth part of it, you have to get the baby out of you some way, somehow, you know, if you're early enough in a pregnancy and you've decided, look, like, I can't be pregnant right now. This is not what I want in my life. They can give you a pill and you basically expel the baby out like you're on a very heavy period. But it's basically like a miscarriage. And fun fact, miscarriages are actually medically known as spontaneous abortions. So when they talk about these abortion bills and banning abortions, they're also saying you can't have a miscarriage <laughs> because medically they're written down as a spontaneous abortion. So how are people supposed to know if they've had a miscarriage or an abortion? You know, like, I mean, you as a person know, but what about your doctor? What about people reporting other people? Like, they don't know, you know? So it's, it, it's very different. Any stage that you are, you have to deliver the baby, however it might be. You know, whether it's with an abortion pill that expels the fetus out or whether you go into the hospital and you deliver the baby and they hand you this little bundle and you're like oh my gosh this little tiny it was this big size of my hand that big and they ask you do you want to hold the baby some people choose to some people don't that was a big thing to decide actually because it's hard <laughs> at 20 and a half weeks. I don't know. Do I want to hold the baby? Do I not want? I was like, I will regret it for the rest of my life if I don't, you know? And I think that most people in that situation feel the same way because I have met many women who have done, you know, termination for medical reasons is what it's called. Um, and the people that didn't, that chose not to hold the baby were the ones that were like, I, I regret not doing that, you know, because it's hard in the moment. You don't want to let go. You just want to hold on. You're, you know, and my husband's like, he's gone. He's not there, you know, but you're just looking at him like, this is my baby, you know, but he's not breathing. He's just eyes are closed. Like it doesn't matter, but, you know, but I don't regret doing that we actually even they even offer pictures a lot of hospitals will offer pictures too we didn't we took just a few on our own but I told my husband I was like I want you to take it on a separate sim card I will probably never look at that sim card ever in my life it's one of the things that is in our safe so god forbid anything ever happened to our house that would actually be saved you know um but it's one of the things I will never look at it ever in my life. But it is one of the things that I don't regret doing. I regret a lot of stuff, but that's not one of them, you know. So, you know, you do produce milk, which is something that they don't tell you that is going to happen. And for some reason, if you're a first time person that has been pregnant and has gone through any of this now, it, it, everything's going to be a surprise to you, you know, like it, it just, there's a lot of things about pregnancy and giving birth that we as a society do not talk about and we really need to, you know, um, but it's stuff that I've already been through, but I forgot about the whole milk thing. And I'm like, oh my God, I have milk coming in. I'm telling my mom, I'm like, mom, I got milk coming in. I'm like, I can't, I can't do this, you know? So we're looking up ways to reduce milk production, ways to, you know, so it's like throw cabbage leaves, cabbage leaves. 
putting on cold cabbage leaves because that helps a with reducing milk production and engorgement. And so it, it's both those things that it solves. And then to bind your chest. So you have to like it like an ace bandage. That's that's what it is. I'm wrapping myself with the ace bandage. To, and there are some amazing women, amazing, that will actually pump that milk out and donate it to, you know, whatever. I commend them <laughs> if they've gone through this and then they're able to do that. That's amazing. I was not that strong. I didn't, I didn't have it in me mentally, physically did not have that in me. The first couple of weeks for me personally, everybody goes, deals with things differently. This was, it's, it's personal. It's so personal. I knew what choice I had made. I knew that there were going to be all sorts of consequences from it. And most of the consequences are going to be in my own head. They're, you know, they're, they're yours. They're mentally yours. You know, people outside can offer sympathy, which everybody did. You know, I had friends come and check on me and just sit with me, whatever. But in the end, it's, it's yours, right? Even my husband, like, you know, he was still, he, he had, he was going through his own grief, right? But I just couldn't take his grief on along with mine. And I made that clear, very, very clear. I said, I cannot take yours on. You have to find your own outlet. I, I'm not it. I'm like, I support you. I love you. Thank you for being here for all of this, but your grief is not my grief. And I can't, I cannot take it on in this instance. I'm not strong enough to, you know, and the doctors, like my doctor was like, whatever pills you need to get you through it, call me, I will write them. I chose not to. That was a personal choice. Mentally, I told myself, you have one month to deal with your grief, to be as grief stricken as you can possibly be, go into that hole. If you want to cry, whatever you need, you have one month to do that. After that month, you have a four-year-old you need to look after and you need to suck it up and focus on her. That was me personally. That is not the case for everybody. Everyone's different. and ev Everybody dealing it with this situation in their own way is correct. There is not a better way. There is, you know, there's worse ways, definitely, but there's no one way is better than the other. It's whatever works for you. So I gave myself that month. I, you know, they'll give you, I'll show it to you. They gave, they have these boxes that they hand out to the, um, there's a, in the hospital, there's, there's a group. They make these boxes and they hand these out to, to all the moms that have gone through that. They gave my daughter a little teddy bear to represent her, you know, her brother because, and they also gave her a book to help her deal with her loss too. You know, they give you a journal um, and there's all kinds of things like in here, you know, that they give you, like they give you like a little hat they give you they put the bracelet in there and I actually haven't opened this box in many years because it's been sitting there I just don't they don't open it you know they and there's words of encouragement and like our last scan I put in there you know um and then also his tiny little feet that they put in there so they, they gave me a journal with, and inside the journal, they had an envelope where every single day you pull out a card and you write whatever you answer the question. It could be as simple as, how are you feeling today? What would you tell your baby if you could? It's very specific to our situation. Our situation meaning, the moms that have carried a baby 
halfway through pregnancy and found out your baby's no longer viable or, you know, the life isn't there, whatever it might be. So it's very specific to that, you know? Um, So for that month, and they give you 30 days worth of cards. And so for that month, I, every day I would read, and I'm not a journaler. I've tried to be, you know, when people try, oh, I'm going to buy all this stuff and do this. I'm going to bullet journal. That is not me. But this was something, it was therapeutic. That was my own personal therapy. And my husband said to me, you know, go to therapy, go talk to somebody. And I was like, no, I don't want to. Again, that was my personal choice. Other people have made, and I think I actually should have gone looking back on things now. But in that instance, I was like, how can I go to therapy? I have a four-year-old at home. You're off at work all day long. Like I have to take her to school. I have to take her to her activities. I have to, you know, you're living with your grief while still living your life, right? And, but that was the way that I sort of dealt with it. I didn't do drugs. I didn't take any drugs, probably should have, but I didn't. I didn't go to therapy, probably should have, but I didn't. It was not, it was, I think it stems from my mom, you know, you know, certain mothers are just like, you have to be strong and you, it's all on you to do it. And I think that I didn't want to disappoint my own mother (laughs) by relying on anything else. And that's the wrong mentality in my opinion, but that's what I did. It's, it is not something I would encourage my own kids. I would be like, no. And, you know, and it was, it was for a month. I allowed myself to wallow. And after that month, I was like, okay, that's it. Month is over. That last day, when I knew the next day, my mental state had to change. It was hard, but I was like, you, you've come far. You know, like I was like mentally just talking to myself. You, you've done it. You've gotten this far. If you feel the need to cry, cry. There's nothing wrong with that. It was, it was, for me, it was more of like, you're not going to take up other people's time talking about your problem anymore because they don't care at this point. Like they're all, you know, all your friends have heard everything that you've had to say. There's no need for you to take up that time. And then at that point my, is when my husband was like, maybe you should go to therapy so you can talk about it. And I was like, no, I'm like, I'm busy. I got things to do. I'm not going to do it, you know? And the next day I just got up and that was it. And I just started like, it was, you know, not that like it didn't happen because it did. And I was truly affected by it, but it was more, I shifted my focus and I was like, all right, it's time to focus on you, little one. You're, you're here let's, let's focus on you. And that was it. And that, and that's what I did, you know? Um, and like I said, it's not necessarily right. It's not necessarily wrong. Could it have gone better? Yes, it could have. Um, they say that when you go through something like that, you should not get pregnant right away because mentally you are not ready. hundred percent agree with that. I did not get pregnant right away. Uh, it was six months and it was not planned, totally not planned, but I got pregnant and I was like, okay, so we're going through this again, you know? Um, and that is a whole story in and of itself too. (laughs) But yeah, it was, it was a while afterwards where mentally we were just like ready. And we had said, and there are women that go through 10 miscarriages that's not me cannot do that I had two and then this and I said to my husband the next time we get pregnant that's it not gonna put my body through it again not gonna emotionally go through it again I would much rather emotionally go through the adoption process than to add my physical you know problems into it too I was like I can't I can't do it you know so that's what we had to say. And I was like, and if it doesn't work out and we're a family of three, then we'd be happy with the family of three that we have. You know, we have a beautiful little girl. She's amazing. You know, I was like, and we just be happy with that. And she's just going to have to understand that 
you know, all our eggs are her, (laughs) you know, so she's going to have to deliver on life. But, you know, we were lucky enough to, I can get pregnant very easily. Staying pregnant is the problem, you know? So, but we were lucky enough where I stayed pregnant and everything was okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's how you deal with, and it's with anything, right? Whether it's a breakup, what whatever it might be like for that's just the way that I am and I'm like if I allow myself to wallow I can get really 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 dark and no one benefits from that certainly not me you know so you I think with anything like I even my daughter didn't get a part in something you know she she auditioned and she didn't get a part in it I said look take today you're you can be upset. You can be sad. Tomorrow you wake up, the world goes on and you just say, okay, learn from this experience. Now you know what it feels like to lose, you know? And I'm like, and that's actually a great feeling because now that fear of losing is gone, you know? So, so I think that there's ways to deal with things. And I think mentally we're all different, obviously, but we all have to come up with our own way that keeps us safe. So, so for your, the first question about not telling her. So when we had initially told everybody that we were pregnant, I was 18 weeks and we actually did it at her birthday party. And we were like, okay, everybody sing happy birthday to the soon to be big sister, you know? And she, four years old, went over her head. She didn't get it. But after that point, like after we had found out, you know, all the problems that we were having, we sat down and we had a talk with her. And we had to tell her, we were like, look, you know, mommy's got a baby in her belly, but the baby is really sick. And, you know, the, the baby's not going to come to like live with, you have to really boil it down to four-year-old terms, you know, and it's like, the baby's not going to come to live with us. Mommy is going to have to go to the hospital and, you know, the babies, they're going to take the baby because he, he he won't be alive anymore. And, you know, and that was really, really hard for her, right? Because we had to, we ended up having to bring her to all of our pediatric cardiologist appointments with us, you know? So she saw on, like when they do the scans, she saw him and everything. And that's one thing that I didn't touch on, but like she, she knew by the time that, you know, and she was, and she went to the school and she told her teachers my mommy's got a baby in her belly but he's sick so I'm not gonna get to be a big sister but it's okay because I'm still a big sister even though he's not with me you know and it was actually trigger points because she would constantly say that I, I'm a big sister I have a baby brother but he's not here anymore like she said that for god a couple years afterwards and it was hard and I you know and she'd be like and she would tell her baby sister once she was born you have a big sister and a big brother but the big brother's not here he's up in the sky with da 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 is what she called her grandfather my my father-in-law and he had passed away so she's like he's up in the sky with da da but don't worry you know so it was it was hard it was triggering but she you know, as they grow up, she's 12 now. So as they grow up, they tend to forget about things or whatever, and not necessarily forget, but you know, it's just not a thing for her anymore. But for a couple of years, it was because that's what she wanted. She wanted to be a big sister. And we told her we're, you know, like, he's still your brother. He's just not going to be here. And it's, it's hard to explain that to a four-year-old. If, they're even younger than four, then you could get away with really not telling them anything, you know? But at four, they're seeing the world and they're recognizing things in the world and they're identifying themselves and other people and they're seeing what other people have and they don't have, you know? So you, and you can't just hope to gloss it over and whatever, especially when I was in the hospital for three days, it's like, where'd mommy go? You know, well, she's in the hospital for three days like that's you can't you can't do that so we were very very upfront with her we explained it to her in terms that we felt she could understand and she processed it in her own way which she just kind of assumed that her 
baby brother was now up in the sky looking at for her and that was it you know there was no she wasn't older old enough to really feel grief um she wasn't at that age which I'm grateful for you know but she was old enough to recognize the loss if that I don't know if that makes sense you know like she could have had what she could have had but doesn't have but it wasn't like a whole grief thing for her and then so you know so for her it was she triggered me a lot for a, for a couple of years afterwards because she would just randomly say something like or she would see a rainbow in the sky and she'd be like oh look Shay sent us a rainbow because we named the baby and I'm like oh geez. So, you know, like it, it was triggering a little bit, but it was sweet too, you know, like it was just so sweet to, of her to think that her baby brother sent her a rainbow, like just for her, you know, that was, it was sweet. Now, when I got pregnant with my second one, all those feelings of craziness came back and I was like high anxiety every single time I mean it was so hard you know I had to go back to taking my injection my blood thinner injections so I had that I was no longer seeing the fertility doctor because we knew what the problem was and my OB could take care of everything so but I still had to go to the neonatal doctor um because I was now termed high risk um pregnancy and I wasn't even 35 yet, but I was termed high risk pregnancy. Um, so I scheduled my appointments because you're supposed to go see each one once a month. I was like, I want it. So I am, I go see my OB. Then two weeks later, I go see my neonatal. And then two weeks later, I'm back at my OB. And two weeks later, I was like, we need it every two, two weeks. And I still remember before every single appointment the day before my hands would be like this like I just couldn't calm myself down because I would be so anxious that they would find something that god forbid this is gonna happen again you know and I'm like like I I remember I just couldn't sit still the day before you know while I'm in the waiting room waiting I just couldn't I couldn't sit still and then you know and the doctor's like I get it I get it. And I'm like, I know I'm like, my blood pressure is probably through the roof right now because it's, it's just, you're just like this, you know, because you just, you don't know, you know? And then at around, and we didn't tell anybody, no one knew we, that's another thing is like that excitement that people get when they're first pregnant and it's a pregnancy that they want. And they're like, yes, we, get, we can tell people at certain, you know, that's stripped away from you big time. You don't want to tell anybody. After two miscarriages and a termination, we weren't telling anybody, no one. Like I finally told my parents and his mom and sister at 28 weeks, you're pregnant for 40 weeks. 28 weeks is when we finally told them and um you know and Eve, like my older one Eva she didn't even know until she's four almost five gonna be five she didn't know until about about that same time when we went we had to go back to the pediatric cardiologist they had to do another neonatal um scan heart scan and she's like wait mama is that a baby in her tummy wait, is that a big, are we having a new baby? Like she just, you know, cause she, she didn't know. That's how she found out was when we went to go get the scan. And I was just like, oh dear God, oh dear God. Like heart palpitating, like, yes, mommy's having a new baby. We're just taking it slowly. And she's like, does this baby have the same problems? And I was like, so far the baby doesn't you know and and at that point she was so careful with me like for everything you know she was the sweetest thing she I'd, I'd be like mama's tired and she's like the baby's making you tired and lay down on the couch you come over and rub my head and like I mean at four years old she'd go get me water like everything she was the sweetest little thing because she was like 
wanting this baby at this point now. <laughs> She's like, this is my baby, you know, like she wanted this baby so bad. And so we didn't tell anybody. I mean, I was 34 weeks. I'm a basketball. I'm, you can clearly see I'm pregnant. Never said I was talking to one of my friends and she's just looking at me and she's like, you didn't tell me something. And I was like, no, I got no news. Like what's going on? You know, like seriously did not tell anybody, you know, finally, I think I was around 35 or 36 weeks. And my friends were like, can we please talk about this now? And I'm like, guys, it's just triggering. Like, I can't like it, it, it I, you know, cause we had told people we're like, we're not going to tell anybody that we're pregnant the next time that it happens until that baby is in hand until we're holding that baby. So up until about 30 to 32 weeks, I was the one that was freaking out. Like before every appointment, I'm the one that's shaking and nervous and whatever. At 32 weeks, I finally just like <sighs> took a deep breath. We had done all of our scans. We'd done everything. We knew she was growing. We knew there was no problems, like nothing. And that's when my husband started freaking out. <laughs> and I was like, it's okay now because if I go into labor, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Like they can, you know, she'll be okay. And he's just like, you know, like he started, he started freaking out at about 32 weeks. So we, we took turns at that, but she came two weeks earlier than she was supposed to, you know, I was like, you need to stay in there. And she said, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." so, I mean, I literally, I went into the hospital at 9 45 in the morning and by I think it was I start I like had five big pushes and she was out like it was she was it was nothing nothing compared to the my previous experience of being in labor for you know a day and a half but she and she was out you know but it was that pregnancy was hard you know and I talk about having a third and my husband's like no it's not we can't go through we we emotionally cannot go through it again you know and he's right I know he's right <laughs> so, and I'm like and now I'm you know I'm, I'll be 42 this year so it's like uh, you know I don't I don't know that my body could handle it anymore either um but yeah like it was that preg that pregnancy is hard after you go through it so, and I know multiple people that have done it and, you know, and then new people, the worst thing about our group is when we get a new person added in and we're just like, oh gosh, like we know exactly what you're going through. And the first, one of the first questions they ask every time never fails. How long was it after your termination that you guys got pregnant and had, an, you know, cause that's all you're thinking about. Right. And, you know, and at, uh, all of us know what to say. And we just say, look, you got to take this time for yourself. And mentally, you won't be there for a little while. Like you, you have to, you have to take the time for yourself and then mentally be there because it's going to be a rough pregnancy, no matter what, you know, everything will go perfectly. Like it did for me, I was very, very sick. That was really it. But she was fine. She, she, she was perfectly fine. You know, perfect little girl. And, but it was, it was a high stress, high anxiety pregnancy. <laughs> when you have a termination for medical reasons, like I did, like a lot of older women tend to, um, and you have that second baby, there's so, it doesn't matter if you don't, pregnancy, there's all kinds of hormones going through you. So postpartum is huge. Like there's just, you're crying one second. You're, you're like, get this baby off of me one second, give her back to me another second, you know? And having had that abortion previous to that is a whole new layer because I saw that beautiful little girl and I just held her, but then I was crying and I was crying because a year before I had just given up a baby, you know, so it was a multitude of tears, like a multitude of emotions. I was 
happy she was here. She was perfect. There was nothing wrong with her. I'm, I get to take her home eventually, um, you know, and, and we get to start this new life. But then you mourn like the life that was lost, you know, and the fact that she would never know about this person before her. Um, because at 20 and a half weeks, that is a baby. When you're talking five, six weeks, it's a fetus. It's still growing. It's a speck. Things happen. I had my first miscarriage at 13 weeks. We were just on the cusp of telling people and I had my first miscarriage. My second one happened at five weeks. It was, you know, so, so I know, and then I have the termination at 20 and a half weeks. So I've had it in almost every trimester, you know, and it's, it's hard, you know, like you, you hold that baby and you're just like so excited. But then at the same time, you have a lot of guilt too. Cause a year later, there's still a lot of residual emotions and guilt and trigger points that happen. And I haven't had a trigger point in a long time now because I'm eight years out, but that's not to say that trigger points don't happen. It actually just happened just three days ago for me. Um, my so my little one is now six and my older one is 12 and the little one made some just I think she went like this she just put her hand on her head and did this and I looked at her I was like you look just like your sister when you do that and she said to me she said it's because she left parts of herself behind in your tummy and it came into me when I was growing in your tummy and I almost lost it in front of them I didn't lose it in front of them but I was like very very like I was I had to get up and walk away because there have been studies that came out and this was an article that I had read directly after my termination that said that every pregnancy that a woman has a piece of that pregnancy that fetus whatever because you share everything right stays within your body and so it becomes part of your bloodstream, whatever. It becomes a part of you, right? So every pregnancy that whether you've had 10 miscarriages and three great children, 13 pregnancies, they're all still with you, right? So it just, it, it was it was weirdly triggering because that article popped back into my head. And I was like, I wonder what she got from a big brother. Like, you know, is her like, daring ways like from him like and it's stupid it's not you know it, it was completely dumb and irrational but it but that's that was that was oddly triggering and I was like oh my gosh and I was like and she would never know you know because she doesn't know she's six years old she doesn't know you know she just thinks it's, it's been her and her sister her whole life now her sister at 12 doesn't say anything anymore but when she was younger she did you know but now she doesn't say anything anymore but yeah like it's hard to have a baby within a year after a termination for sure it is it's it's hard that's why we in the group when people ask that we say you have to take the time unfortunately that's it's not what anybody wants to hear they want to hear hey two months later I was pregnant again yeah you could be but mentally are you ready for that roller coaster because six months later mentally I was not ready for that roller coaster um it was it was hard you know and you're happy you're sad you're you feel guilty because you're celebrating this new life, but you gave up an old life, you know, like it's a lot of stuff that you go through. So it's, and you're going to feel it all. There's nothing wrong with it. You have to, you know, you have to be appreciative of what you got and then allow yourself to feel the sadness of what you lost too. And that's okay. And for her to say that during this, and it was literally like two days ago that it happened. And it was right, like two days ago was right around that time that we had found out all this stuff that happened eight years ago, you know, um, it was in 2014. So, you know, so it was just weird that she said that. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, I have a friend, every time she sees a butterfly, she thinks it's her little girl 
coming down to say hi. I have never had signs like that. <laughs> That's not, I, I don't know if it's because my lack of faith in God or whatever it might be. Like, I don't, I believe in the universe, you know, like I'm not, I believe in karma, whatever, but you know, things like that. I'm kind of like, okay, that was a little bit weird. <laughs> um, as far as people do, people join our group. It's sad. It's horrible. Um, you know, we'll get a notification. Someone, this person is new and we always ask them because the thing is, as women, we want to talk about it. There are some women that don't, but the majority of women want to talk about it without feeling judged. And our termination for medical reasons group that we have, that's what you get. You get the ability to talk about your situation and not be judged at all by anybody. Doesn't matter. We have women in there who are hardcore Catholics who, you know, have they 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 can't they can't talk about it with anybody you know because they would get judged for whatever for making the choice that they did we don't do that because we've all made the same choice in the end whatever our baby's problems were and like I said they run the spectrum of what it could be you know it could be a baby that had severe down syndrome and you know, and while we know that people with Down syndrome can live, can function, can be, are amazing human beings, there, that's again, a spectrum, you know, like there could, there's on the flip side of that, there's also ones that they're just not viable pregnancies, you know, like you can't, you cannot, they just couldn't bring this person into this world and watch them be in pain all the time whatever the reason it is. And there's all kinds of um, problems. I'm actually the only one with, am I the only one? Yeah, I think so. I'm the only one that has had, that I terminated for, for the medical reason that I did, which is HLHS, you know, hypoplasty left heart syndrome. Um, everybody else is trisomy, you know, 13, that's a common one. Um, there's lots of things, you know, the, the one thing that I will say to anybody who, and I think this is the case, whether you're 16, 20, 40, whatever, if you're early on in your pregnancy, later in your pregnancy, just take a minute. It's hard. Just take a minute and imagine what it is you want your life to look like. A year from now, you're pregnant right now. What's it going to look like a year from now? If you're 16 and you're like, crap, I'm going to have a kid. I'm not going to be able to finish school, whatever. You take that minute and you imagine what it is that you, your life is going to look like. And then you decide this, that is not the life that I want. That's the right choice for you. If you're 22, just out of college and you're starting your career and you're like, okay, I think I can do this. That's the right choice for you. Whatever choice you make is the right choice for you. If you're like 22 and you're like, I'm going to give the baby up for an adoption because for whatever reasons, again, that choice is fantastic for you to make. I had a friend who was in medical school, actually, and she got pregnant. She's like, I can't, I can't do this. And I was like, nope. Like, then you make that choice and you do, you know, you do what you have to do, you know, because we are not put on this earth to just be baby makers and baby producers. We are our own human beings, you know, like I, if I'm sorry, but if men were the ones that were carrying babies, we would not have this question. This would not be a debate at all. Okay. Like there, no, it would never even be questioned as females. It's of course, everything we do is questioned. It always will be. It doesn't matter, you know, and the burden of it, of society always falls on our shoulders, like of children. It always falls on the female shoulders. 
so to take that choice away, whatever reasoning it is, I don't care your reason that you do what you do. I don't care that you, you know, you, you gave up, you decide to carry that baby and give it up for adoption because you don't believe in abortion, but you respect my choice. I'm good with that. You know, like you're good with me making my choice. I'm good with you making your choice. But I think that you do have to take a second before you, for us, it was like a good 10 days before it, and it was like really my husband, like I was, I got there much faster than he did. Um, but you, it does take a minute to really, you know, say, yes, this is what I want to do. And then once you make that choice, it's hard to wrap your head around it, but you have to and I always said, I said to my husband, I was like, whatever choice we make in the end, it's us that lives with the consequences of it. It's us that lives with the guilt, whether we have that guilt or not. I still feel guilt. It doesn't matter. If it's wrong, it's right. I have two beautiful kids. I still feel guilt. You know, my life would be very, very different than it would be than it is right now. And I don't know if my 12 year old would resent me more than the teen angsty resentment that she currently has, you know, like, because all of my energies would be focused elsewhere. And that I think was my biggest reason was I have a child I have to look after. I cannot focus on another child. And we looked at forums. We look, I mean, we, we we did our research for coming to our conclusion, but again, our situation is that we're established. We had a kid. We, you know, we had the means of taking care of even a sick child. You know, like we had all that available to us. A lot of people don't, and that's that should that should be it. Is like, you know, I don't have the ability to take care of this kid. I can barely take care of myself. That's it doesn't matter shouldn't matter so we did this also we had his little handprints and then like his little footprints like made and then um the people at the hospital like loved this so then I created like just a digital image for other parents so it's you know it's not stuff that we tend to look at much anymore I got an ornament on our Christmas tree. <laughs> we have we have a little S for him on our Christmas tree and a little train, you know, um, that my husband had bought that first year and that went on our Christmas tree. But that's, you know, after a while, it just, you live with it. You move forward. You don't think you can. And then you're eight years later. <laughs> And you're like, wow, come really far, you know, but it was, it was good to talk. Abortion shouldn't be this shunned thing, you know, like we are supposed to be a developed nation and we're still fighting this fight. You know, I had a, I had a very conservative uh, friend of mine and he said, you know, cause I said something about like oh, these stupid laws that are coming up in Texas. And he's like, well, you know, you can always fight it. And I was like, you have girls. It's like, you have two little girls. I was like, do you really want them fighting this same fight in 20 years? It's like, because that's literally what we're doing right now from the 70s. It's like, we're fighting the same fight. It's like, we should be done with this already. This shouldn't even be a thing anymore. It should be done. You know, it's like, and he just, he couldn't respond to that because I'm like, we've been fighting this for 40 years now. And I'm like, and we're still fighting. It. Like, why? <laughs> you don't get it. I don't understand it. But, you know, I guess as long as there's women, we'll always be fighting. <laughs> so.